My name is Maha Ashur, and I'll be sharing with you today the role of uh, radar in autonomous vehicle and also in driver assist. As you can see in my opening slide, that MetaWave is focused on automotive radars. We're getting also into the aerial radars, uh, different frequencies, and uh, working also on the connectivity in the infrastructure as well as the connectivity on, in the car. I'll be touching base on most of these aspects during my presentation. Um, let me just go to the next slide. But I'm going to start by sharing with you a very high-tech slide where we talk about the past, present, and the future. We all know about Moore's Law, uh, taking these uh, digital zeros and one and manipulating them and looking at how the chip enabled us to have a supercomputer in our pocket. And what does this mean for the future as we get into these high frequencies? So um, I'll be addressing the opportunity uh, that uh, combines both the digital, which is the um, manipulating the zeros and ones signals, as well as the analog, and in particular, the software-defined antenna in package modules. So what do these software-defined antenna in package module uh, do for the radar? But before I do that, uh, maybe some of you already have an iPhone, especially an iPhone 12. And just recently, uh, Apple uh, announced that they will be increasing the shipment of these 5G millimeter wave iPhone. That is a tiny slot on the side, and that's a millimeter wave AIP. So we see now these modules inside cell phones for a very good reason, higher level of integration, lower cost, higher processing and outstanding performance. So we're borrowing these kind of futuristic trend in technology and bringing them inside our radar. And we are a leader in that space. So in a nutshell, MetaWave is focused on two markets. Uh, the first market is the radar for autonomous vehicle and driver assist. The second one is about the connectivity, mainly working with the top telecom carriers in the world, um, in their industrial, in their enterprise, in the uh, automated manufacturing and so forth applications. And hopefully soon when these level four cars become uh, available on the road, we'll be in the V2X and maybe even V2V communication. And you can see here in the picture um, that I selected for the car, uh, I basically in particular, and on purpose, I put it in a foggy environment. And if I look outside my window here in San Diego, we call it the June gloom. This time it's May gloom. Every morning we get fog until 10 a.m. So driving on the road, either on freeway or, 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 or side roads along the ocean, you always get this fog. So the question is, if you're uh, driving your own car, a Tesla with an autopilot, it becomes an issue. And this is where the radar excels. Uh, what are our uh, product portfolio today and in the future? So uh, I'll be talking to you today about our uh, AIP model uh, that uh, will be the core enabling product inside the radar and also explain to you where we sit and we fit in the value chain. Um, this is the first uh, enabled uh, beam steering and beam forming uh, chip at the edge uh, and also um, we are the only company so far that demonstrated real-time uh, object classification, which is the AI enabling for very good reasons. I will not be addressing, of course, the 5G, but you can see in the future, we can borrow a lot of the work that we're doing in automotive AIP modules into the telecom sector. The background image here, it shows you the future, how um, level four and level five cars, um, maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now, will be the norm of uh, mobility and also vehicle and good uh, transportation of, the, of people and, and goods. So the outline, I'll be talking initially about the ADAS sensors in general, the role of the spectral radar uh, as a primary sensor in those uh, uh, sensor fusion uh, stacks, and why simultaneous analog and digital um, is a must. And I, I kind of hinted early on when I talked about the software defined antenna in package or AIPs. Um, so hopefully you will appreciate that uh, 
borrowing these technologies from the cellular where the volume is like in the, in the billions of units, that means price is going to go down. Leveraging these kind of technologies will enable um, the automotive sector to meet its performance at the right price, the right size, and most importantly, at the right power consumption. All right, so let's talk about safety because safety is always going to be uh, essential uh, for these cars. Maybe less for L2 Plus than you saw Tesla, you know, moving away from full autonomy to uh, autopilot to uh, driver responsibility for very good reason, right? Because the liability has to sit somewhere. And today, all the cars that you see on, on, on the road are, are either um, driven by the driver being liable or for mobility as a service, uh, like the Cruise and Waymo, it's basically the, the service provider is that is liable. And I also put the aerial because we see um, the trend to uh, transport people as well as goods uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the airborne uh, application. And mainly here, the radar is going to be extremely critical for takeoff and landing because of the obstruction that can happen uh, for the cameras and line out. All right, so let's now go into the core discussion. Uh, maybe some of you already is aware of all these different levels. I started with level two, because this is something that we see more and more becoming the trend. Driver assist, more sensors in the car, and also uh, ability to uh, change lanes, the ability to maintain the car in its lane, ability to detect cars, an object, uh, the stop, and so forth. And we, this is going to improve over time um, for two reasons. Number one, the sensor will become more and more uh, you know, capable of uh, operating in all of these environments. Uh, and number two, the brain that basically uh, detect these signals and provide the full perception becomes smarter and smarter. And, and once you enable also the V2V, V2X, uh, things are going to become much smoother. But what I highlighted here is that for level zero to level three, which is something that is uh, uh, on either on the road or uh, in the pipeline, and that the driver is in the loop. That means the driver is always sitting behind the driver, the, 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 the car wheel, and uh, will take over full control when the, when the car uh, gets into these very uh, critical situations. But as you get to level four, level five, the driver is out of the loop and the liability will sit on the OEM or the, and the tier ones that are part of the uh, ecosystem of, of these vehicles. Uh, so we'll be talking about these uh, driver in the loop, driver out of the loop, all the full software stack, as well as the role of the sensor and in particular the radar sensor to enable these, uh, you know, this, this, this trend to happen. All right, so what does, it, what does this translate in terms of sensor? And this is kind of, the, you see a lot of examples. I think every OEM, every, uh, you know, these autonomous vehicle service providers, they all have various applications. And my last slide, you will see a, a different number of sensors on these vehicles. So you see in level two uh, plus LL3 that you need at least uh, six radars, mainly uh, one in the front center, two in the front corner. Those are going to be very critical because they will be detecting the objects, uh, especially if the car is making a left turn to making sure you avoid any accidents. And as you go to L4, L5, you see the 360 degree view and you see also the same thing for the cameras and the same thing for the, for the LiDAR. I also added here the ultrasonic, there's also the infrared, the V2X and, and, and so forth. So something to keep in mind from this slide is that the radar is essential in driving both the L2 plus to the L4, L5. So what does a sensor fusion look like? And you see here on the left are all the kind of the, the hardware sensor from radar, LiDAR, cameras, uh, as well as the, um, the processing of these uh, data that is, that are, that's coming out of these sensors uh, in terms of object detection, lay detection. Uh, and the radar today uh, does the object detection, does the uh, speed um, 
extraction for the cruise control and so forth. Um, but how can you really locate the, the, the car in its grid uh, on, uh, you know, on a freeway lane or in a uh, intersection uh, scenarios and so forth? For this, you need to be able to have a higher resolution. That means the ability to separate objects, not only to detect a lump of object, but also to separate them in real time and to separate them accurately. So you wanna make sure you have the best false positive and false negative numbers to be able uh, to operate very smoothly. And that's why you see that line in gray between radar and occupancy grid map uh, is, uh, is highlighted in gray because you need these higher performance radar uh, to be able to uh, respond very quickly and also to have almost near perfect perception uh, in a very cluttered environment. And think about cluttered environment, driving, for example, in an intersection in, in Italy, in, in, a, in a downtown city in Italy, where you have um, kind of chaotic environments. And also it has to be at a reasonable cost. You know, we've seen when we started MetaWave in 2017, some of these sensors, they cost tens of thousands of dollars but the reality is you need to have a very strong roadmap to bring it down to hundreds of, uh, uh, of dollars, if not tens of dollars for some of the other sensor like the mono cameras and so forth. And on the top here, right in that box, you see all of these different functionalities that the sensor fusion has to do, detecting hazards, predicting these cut-ins and cutouts, being able to detect and track uh, you know, all the objects, and in particular, objects that carries people, uh, like motorcycle, like bicycles, which are sometimes difficult to distinguish uh, in a cluttered environment. So, so hopefully, by the end of this presentation, you will understand why this gray line is, is possible with the MetaWave uh, radar. So, Let's talk a little bit about what we talk. What, what, what do we mean by 5D imaging radar? So typically, uh, in an environment uh, of any sensor, you generate all of these uh, raw data that is coming. You have the analog sensor, which is basically the camera and lidar, and then you have, of course, the digital sensor, which is the camera. But part of, once you receive this raw data, you digitize them, so you create these kind of point cloud and you process the data. And some of the data is processed at the edge, others are processed both at the edge and in the centralized uh, computer system. But the radar is able, it's able to detect the range of the object and typically you need to have the range quite accurate, especially at a shorter distance because you're about to hit that object. A longer distance, if you have like uh, some sort of uh, buffer of these uh, errors, it should be fine. And then you need to be able to locate this object both in horizontal and, and, and vertical direction. We've seen a lot of these Tesla cars um, kind of uh, uh, confused about a bridge versus a truck because there is no elevation um, you know, uh, data that is coming from, from the current radar on, on, on these Tesla cars. So being able to distinguish both uh, or locate this object in horizontal and elevation is very critical. And unlike other sensors, because the radar operates with an FMCW signal, it can also detect the velocity of the object. There are some FMCW LIDAR, uh, and they, do, they have such capability, they tend to be a little bit on a, the pricey range. And the number five, which is the fifth label, which is something that MetaWave has pioneered, and at the same time has successfully patented, is the classification. How do you provide the label? That means if you're doing, uh, if your car is making a left turn and there is a, a motorcycle coming from the right at a fast speed, how can the car know that this is a motorcycle uh, and, 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 and alert the sensor fusion about it in order to stop or, uh, or slow down? All right, so let's talk a little bit. We talked about the level four, level five and where the liability falls. And you can see here on the right, uh, are the, is, is a list of all the OEMs, both the traditional OEMs, as well as the what we call the new kids on the block, like Waymo, Cruise, and so forth. And then you have next to it in yellow uh, are the tier ones, basically the suppliers to these OEMs. So we decided we're not going to be a tier one. The line of companies, they had to be their own tier ones because when they started working on these LiDAR sensors, none of these tier ones or OEM 
even knew about this sensor being used inside vehicles. Um, but radars have been around for over a decade, uh, if not even longer than that. So that's why we decided we're not going to be a tier one. And most of the new players or startups in that space, they are either a tier two or a tier two plus. So MetaWave is a tier two plus. In most of the ecosystem, the way how we work with our customers, we are qualified as a tier two plus. We select from these green list, the tier ones, the tier twos, that suits these uh, key performance metrics, our KPIs. Uh, and uh, for example, you can select uh, TI, you can select NXP, you can select Infineon. And most importantly, these tier two chipsets are already, most of them are qualified by the tier ones and the OEMs. So it makes meeting these uh, functional safety requirements early on uh, much easier. So most of the startups in the tier two categories as you will see later, like Undur or RB Robotics, they're going to have some tough time convincing the tier ones or the OEMs to adopt their, pro their, their, their chipset because it takes time uh, to, to meet all of these functional safety. Now, you see here on the top left an example of a board. It's a TI cascaded board. It's, you can Google it and find it online as well. But you will see the traditional radar today. And if you open any radar today on the market, and these high frequencies, you can still see the old fashioned conventional antennas printed on a PCB. I speak about old fashioned because that's the only technologies that this company borrowed from the low frequencies. So remember the iPhone 12, where that little, little tiny slit where you have all the antennas for the, uh, for the millimeter wave 5G, we are replacing these old fashioned with these antenna in package, uh, making them so software enabled uh, front end module, basically to balance the complexity between the back end digital processing and the front analog signal. And so far we are pioneering this space in radar. We're quite excited. No one has done it at 77 gigahertz. And uh, I believe that many companies are gonna follow our footsteps. That's why we filed over 250 patents with the first 18 patents being issued and allowed. So let me take you a little bit into understanding Radar and LiDAR to a certain extent operates in the same way. So the car basically transmits a signal. It could be modulated in various ways and receives a reflection. And it basically analyzes the reflections that it receives from all the objects, all the clutters. And uh, you know, you can do it in two ways. I'm talking about the brute force way. Number one, you can eliminate the full field of view, both the azimuth and elevation, as you can see on the bottom right. It makes the signal weaker. That means the reflection weaker. That means the range very short. I'm talking about short, not very short, but I'm talking about short, something that cannot meet the 250 plus, 300 meter plus range that the, the KPIs now that are emerging uh, to meet the, 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 the safety requirement that, is, uh, that are imposed by uh, um, municipalities. Um, so, um, or you can basically focus the beam. Instead of spreading it over the full field of view, you can just focus it and just move it around over the full field of view, which makes it slow. So either you don't have enough signal or you need more time to do it. So how do you really solve the problem? So you're talking about all analog versus all digital. How can you combine the two and create a perfect environment uh, for, the, for the company? So welcome to Spectra uh, and the 5D imaging radar, uh, balancing both the complexities between the analog and digital. So this is to get uh, the optimal range at the best accuracy and resolution with the best field of view coverage and uh, also the optimal speed, size and, uh, and, uh, and, and target cost. And uh, as you see on the bottom, uh, you know, all the way on the bottom here, I bring back the software defined AIP. That AIP that you saw on the iPhone 12, that AIP cost that's gonna be driven uh, so low because to be able to uh, meet these billions of units, you, the, the production has to uh, increase over time and the cost is gonna drop. So taking advantage of that is very critical. Remember Moore's law, right? How, how pricing have been, uh, uh, dropping over time while the performance has been increasing. So 
again, software-defined IAP is the new Moore's law from the future. And in particular for the radar is how do you combine these analog beam forming and steering and the digital model. All right, so let's spend some time on this picture. So now instead of having uh, a pencil beam, remember the all analog on the bottom left picture here, uh, and remember the all digital where on the bottom right picture here, how can you just create a fan? So you have now a, a signal that is uh, squeezed into uh, in, in the elevation plane. So you see like a strip of these high power uh, signals and you're basically fanning the signal along the elevation uh, you know, range. Or you can do it in opposite. You can basically fan the signal along the azimuth. And I'll show you an example later on why fanning the signal in the azimuth makes a lot of sense in some application. But you do have that flexibility. Um, so when you do this, you can get a reflection from these objects located very far. I see a question here. 77 gigahertz uh, millimeter wave is also approved to be used in aviation. No, so uh, that's a very good question. I think 77 gigahertz is for automotive, for aviation is the 24 gigahertz. Uh, but as you know, 5G starts from 24 all the way to 40. Uh, and, uh, you know, we do have some plans into creating these AIPs, as I showed you before, not only at 77 gigahertz, but uh, uh, you saw the E-band as well, uh, but also at 24, maybe 28, maybe 39. It's, it's a long road and we want to be a leader in that space. Good question. Please let these questions come in uh, because so far we have plenty of time and I want to have this session to be quite interactive. So let's go over the number. What can this uh, simultaneous digital and analog capability bring to the, um, uh, to the table? Uh, just kind of a side note here. Sometimes I see highlights about uh, radar on a chip that is not such a thing as a radar on a chip. If I take just a chip, one of these chipsets, that is no way that that little size, you basically will be violating all the laws of physics to, to say that that chip itself can uh, provide a full perception uh, of the radar. Uh, the performance is driven by both the chip and the antenna and front end design. So that's, that, that's the key. And we don't have to look very far, just look what the military has been doing with its radar uh, all along. So to get to the 350 meter, and in particular 350 meter over a wider field of view, because if you take a look at the county, for example, the, the top county long range, like the ASR 540, as, well, as, as they go to this 250 meter, their field of view shrinks. They shrinks tremendously because they couldn't control the side load levels. And they do it with this uh, uh, beam forming, the, the old fashioned beam forming embedded in the, in the tier two chair chipset, but since MetaWave is doing it with these AIPs, they can control the side lobe levels very well, and you can get to these long ranges. You can detect pedestrian 250 meters while making sure you still cover a wider field of view, and I will explain to you why very soon. Um, and then we talk about angular accuracy and angular resolution. So these are two separate things, and I'll explain to you what, what are the, the things that separate them. And, and today, you know, the, the radar that we are offering to and have been tested on cars, trucks, and trains uh, does meet these ranges, um, does meet these uh, pretty close to these uh, angular accuracy and angular resolution number at these long ranges. So people can tell you, yes, I can do one degree, but can you do it at the long range? You see, that's, that's, that's the critical thing. So uh, accuracy is when you can separate two cars on two different lanes, like one in the outgoing lanes, one in the incoming lane because they have different uh, speeds or at different ranges. So that's accuracy. That means they have something different, either the, the, the distance from the car or the velocity they are driving at. The resolution is actually more complex. It's like you are on a freeway, you have a motorcycle and you have a car next to it, but both driving at the same distance, they're both driving at the same speed. They're very close to each other, but how can the radar distinguish between them uh, so this is what we talk about, it's one, one, uh, one, one degree angle or re resolution. Um, so, and then the more, uh, other uh, critical point is the update rate. That means if I have this 120 degrees field of view and I'm 
steering maybe plus or minus 10, plus or minus 20 in the elevation, how much time do I need to basically analyze a full scene? That's what we call the update rate. So the update rate, it's not the time it takes just for that slice, that thread slice to be fully executed, but when you fan it all along the, the vertical elevation plane. And here, of course, there are different KPIs, different environment. AI plays a role here. Uh, eventually down the road, the feedback from the sensor fusion, maybe with these digital maps, also would enable uh, that, that interaction as well. Um, but uh, the, the, the update rate is not just driven by, by the radar itself, by the front end AIP or antenna radar analog portion, but it's driven by the back end, which kind of processor you use. And processor means price, processor means uh, capability, means memory, means speed, uh, architecture, and, and so forth. Um, so, and, and eventually we will see the processors uh, to improve over time to meet these uh, emerging new K -K KPIs. And the AWARE, as I mentioned, is the fifth dimension that provides the object classification. Uh, so the sensor fusion now gets the raw data, gets the process data, all the way up to the label of, of, of these objects. Now, uh, the last bullet here you see on the left is interference. So when you have these all digital and you're illuminating the full scene, uh, getting interference from other radar, because these are very high power radar, you're talking about 55 dBm ERP, even though it is spread over that white cone, uh, you will be susceptible to interference. You have five gigahertz, that means you can move between different frequency bands within that five gigahertz band to uh, reject interference, that's one way of doing it. But when you have, of course, a pencil beam is the best because you, you're avoiding interference all along. Or if you have that fan beam, uh, it's because you have a higher level of SNR and you have additional degrees of freedom, you can address interference uh, much better. Okay, so let's talk, show you some, some of the examples here. 300 meters is not a very long range. In the bottom left, you can see it's the distance from where the car is um, to that uh, paying booth. That's 300 meter. Uh, so the, the, the ability for the car to be able to see that far, especially on a freeway or a highway, is, is extremely important. And you can see here on the right, some of the detection of our cars uh, all the way to 300, and as you will see later, about beyond 300 meter. So 300 meter, is a must. Being able to operate in, in all kinds of weather conditions, maybe if not for the L2+, plus because the driver is liable, so the driver can take over, but definitely as you get to level four, especially here in San Diego, you don't want to stop this uh, uh, mobility as a service uh, capabilities or delivery of goods if you have these very foggy mornings every day. Now let's talk here a little bit about the fog. So you can see here on a freeway, the camera is completely blind, cannot see anything beyond uh, maybe a few tens of meters, whereas you can see the radar can still be able to detect object uh, at 300 meter. And on the right here is exactly what I mentioned, the angular accuracy. So this is with our current, current Fuji radar platform. You see, we built the, the, the modules, the component, but we do have to demonstrate the full radar capability. Um, so, uh, like Qualcomm, to demonstrate CDMA, they had to build the full base station, the full cell phone. Um, so, we have to build the full um, radar to demonstrate it. And this is one of the measured data you can see here at 300 meter. How precise is the radar to separate both the outbound and the inbound lane that are separated by 0 0.4 degrees? So, it was quite... Um, and the word we hear from our customer, consistently. That means our radar is always consistently uh, performing this way because it's analog. Our competitors, they rely only on the digital signal processing. They call it digital radar or they call it AI radar. They rely on the zeros and one bits, which sometimes uh, can converge, but not to the right uh, solution. So uh, the analog portion brings you this uh, higher level of fidelity in, 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 in driving these cars. This is an example of a detection of a car. You can see here all the way to about 300 meter. You can see here the pedestrian at 250 meter. I think it's the only pedestrian radar that can detect pedestrian at these long ranges. 
um, I have to admit, maybe 250 meters a stretch, but definitely at 200 meter, the, the, the radar is consistently detecting these pedestrians. And pedestrians are a little bit more uh, challenging because they are not, they don't have the reflection unless they are wearing some sort of metallic ja jackets or holding metallic briefcases. Um, but typically their cross section is very small, so they are very hard to detect. And of course, it's very important to detect them as well. Another example here is the, how, the, how, how raw is the data that we can provide our customers. This is an example of a car in a parking lot. This is our parking lot. You can see the sunset here behind the Carlsbad Beach. Uh, so the car is basically open and you have a passenger that is coming out of the car. Just the raw data without any processing, without any AI, you can distinguish the back of the car from the door that is open from the passengers coming out of the car. So this is really quite remarkable. You can go to our YouTube videos and see the full video of how this uh, actually unfolds. And some customers, they appreciate uh, using the, the raw data because they have their own post-processing that they want to do on the raw data in addition to our post-processing. So it enables them to have this capability with this high-performance radar. Oh, uh, okay, actually I have the video here, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know that. You can, you can see here in the video how the passenger is uh, coming out from the car and how you can distinguish between him, uh, the door, as well as, as the back of the car. Let's see he's walking. And as he's walking, you can see him here separated. Now he's coming closer to the camera. Okay, so let's talk about fog. I mentioned to you that we have, um, we have two uh, sensor fusion platforms, one based on the Valadine LiDAR, the other one is based on the Blackmore LiDAR. So the Blackmore LiDAR, as you will see later, we use it to do the AI. And in, in this one, you can see here how the LiDAR, the Valadine LiDAR radar range uh, shrinks to below 20 meter. And this is a very typical morning foggy day. In, in San Diego. And you can also see the camera cannot even see beyond these traffic lights, whereas the radar can still see uh, at 300 meter. Uh, this is actually the video that can show you the performance of, of, the, of the radar in, in this very harsh environment. And you can see the LiDAR is basically um, useless uh, in, in, in this case. And you can see also some of the glare that happens on the camera too, because the sun is in front of you. This is during sunrise. Uh, in, in, in San Diego. So I hope I convinced you that having this high performance radar is uh, quite critical as we transition to the higher level of uh, driver assist, L2+, plus, or they call them L2++, plus plus, all the way up to the L4 and L5. And these kind of uh, videos are also available in, uh, in our YouTube channels. And I put here the two different Velodyne LiDARs and the cameras and that, that, that are used in this, uh, in this setup. So in summary, uh, range, as I mentioned, beyond 300, and, uh, 300 meter, angular resolution, all the videos you saw today is at 1.2 degree at 300 meter, we're going into one degree, angular accuracy today is at 0 0.4, going to 0 0.2 at 300 meters. So don't be fooled, there's some competition they tell you, Oh, we can do 0.1, but can you do it at 300 meter? Show me. Because slides and simulations is something, but show me the data, the capture data. Once you see that, then I believe it. Uh, and then, of course, the field of view. So today we are at 45 degrees. That's why you saw most of the video at 45. But we're going because we're doing this uh, point uh, steering, uh, and we're going into 120 degrees, uh, 15 to 25 hertz, because these are kind of the limitation of today's processor. But as, as these processors uh, improve over time and our, the complexity of our, our algorithms improve over time, we can get to the 40 hertz. Uh, and in particular, of course, the antenna and package module uh, for higher level of integration and capabilities. Now let's talk about the AI. So as I mentioned, we are the only company today that can demonstrate real-time object detection and classification at these long ranges. You can see here the pedestrian is, um, identified in yellow, the car is identified in green, and the static objects are identified in, in blue. Uh, all the boxes here on both the cameras and the uh, 
uh, and the radar data are extracted from the uh, spectral radar plus the AWARE uh, platform. Uh, the red lines you see here on the right, this is the Blackmore LiDAR. So I told you we have two sensor fusion system that we are using in our analysis, uh, and especially for this machine learning platform from the AI, we base it on, on the Blackmore uh, LiDAR. So, uh, so it's very exciting uh, that uh, we are able to get to the 94% accuracy at these long ranges. And the training is happening, of course, offline uh, by using some manual ground truth verification, typically 5%, between three to 5% um, manual verification is, is, is enough. Remember I talked, uh, I, um, I, I addressed about this fan and you can fan either in the elevation plane or you can fan in the azimuth plane. This is an example for a rear view truck application. So let me tell you a little bit about how do the truck uh, AV truck, these are fully autonomous truck operate. They cannot mount any sensor on the trailers because the trailers basically are changed. Uh, all the sensors are mounted on the, on the engine uh, portion of the truck. So you can see here uh, on the two side mirrors, you can put our radar and this has been uh, tested with multiple uh, customers. And because the radar is basically steering in the, in the azimuth plane, uh, you can avoid the reflection, basically the blinding reflection from the side of these trailers. So this is, uh, you know, like a, a conventional operation, and this is how you can operate uh, to avoid reflection from the side trailer. If you remember that digital radar where you have the full cone, uh, you know, illuminating, all of these reflections will basically blind uh, the, the, the radar, and you won't be able to uh, track or detect objects that are uh, behind the, the, the truck or uh, changing lanes and passing the truck. Okay, so in a nutshell, what does MetaWave do? Uh, so I, I shared with you all of this uh, uh, exciting um, you know, knowledge. Uh, let's put it all together. As I mentioned, we are a tier two plus. We work with the tier twos and we basically work with the top tier twos that have been already validated and, and approved by our customers. So mainly uh, Texas Instruments, Infineon, and XP. Uh, and we build these Lego sets. Remember the software-defined AIPs? These are the Lego sets. So you can configure these AIPs as a one phase array antennas. This is a one mode of operation. Or you can use them as a MIMO uh, uh, virtual array. So each column is um, configured separately or you can use them in these like tiny little squares. So that's what we call a software defined AIP. Uh, and also, uh, you know, the ability to combine the MIMO in the back end with the front end in a more, uh, you know, flexible way. And, and being able to generate a single platform, this is a key. So our customer can have a single platform and they can just derive from that single platform, the front center, the corner radar, the back radar, distributed radar, uh, because these AIPs are basically um, is the outlet to the uh, to the outside surrounding of the car to be able to function properly. And in the heart of this AIP, as you can see on the top left, is our embedded Marconi chips. These are the beam forming and steering. It's the only is the first and only chip today at 77 gigahertz. Um, that basically resides on the bottom of these antenna in package, the 16 uh, uh, an element antenna in package. And you have this uh, signal that's coming out and or in that uh, Marconi chip is connecting to one of these TI chips or and, and, and so forth. These are the AWR uh, TI chips um, that we have been using. Um, so it's, uh, this brings uh, the lowest cost the highest level of integration, because you can see here, you can mount your component now be, uh, you know, be on the bottom of, of the PCB, and you have all of the antennas already calibrated, already integrated, already uh, certified as an automotive uh, qualified unit, and you're basically ready to go from day one. So that brings, as I mentioned, the, mod the modularity, uh, the lower cost, the highest performance, and the highest level of integration. So we're very excited to be um, a leader in that radar space, like you saw in the iPhone, uh, you know, using similar concepts uh, in that very, very tiny space 
uh, with highest performance. Let me tell you a little bit about V2X. I know I have only a few minutes left. So what does V2X bring in? Because as you know, we are in the telecom sector with putting our 5G uh, solution in, in, in networks. Um, it basically enables the car as it get closer to intersection, knowing that you have an ambulance coming or you have a fire truck coming. So those are gonna have some specific signals uh, in the V2V uh, communication, so it can slow down. Because remember, you don't have a driver now. Maybe the car cannot hear a siren, so it needs to know exactly which kind of a car that is coming. So this is where the V2V. And then these light, uh, you know, street lights can also be conveyed uh, in, in a V2X fashion to these cars. So the car not only, uh, if the camera cannot see the light, they, they know exactly the status of this uh, intersection. And down the road, you don't probably even need those, those lights because everything is going to be uh, well uh, uh, you know, integrated in the smart infrastructure without having light, just having sensors <clears throat> that basically uh, transmit these kind of signals. I'm not going to go over this full kind of uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, sensor fusion that also include the V2X, but you can clearly here see how the, uh, the hardware in the loop. So remember, we talked about driver in the loop, driver out of the loop. Now we talk about hardware in the loop, which is in the closed loop. That means only the car, um, that, that is uh, everything in the car, uh, is, is, is operating independently from the outside. And that's critical for security in case that there is a potential hack. Uh, the car has to make its own decision independently from any V2X information or uh, an, an open loop where it can accept V2V and V2X uh, information. And to optimize the power consumption, uh, in my opinion, um, maybe it will be 10% uh, closed loop and maybe even 90% uh, open loop because that really reduces the power consumption and the processing power inside the car. Another factor, of course, is the, as I mentioned, the power consumption. So I'll give you an example of an autopilot because I own an S, uh, a Tesla S model. And I notice when I uh, turn on my, my autopilot and I drive on the freeway, the range basically is reduced by 30% because of all of the camera processing that it has to do. And remember, it has to see the full scene and it has to uh, operate to make sure that uh, it can uh, change lane or stop or slow down uh, before it hits any, any, any object. Uh, so, so the question is that how do you really reduce uh, you know, this number, 25 or 30%? One way of doing it, remember when we were talking about the long range, another way that you will start hearing regions of interest. So because the radar can see these very far long ranges, uh, the sensor fusion already knows which uh, areas it needs to focus as the car gets closer to them. Uh, now the camera and the LiDAR, they don't have to uh, process the full 360-degree uh, view and all the, the additional elevation, but just focus on this region of interest, and that will reduce uh, the time, that would reduce also the power consumption. Um, so um, this is my uh, last slide. I want to thank uh, um, you know, AUSV for the opportunity to share with you this exciting uh, futuristic uh, vision of this next generation of radar and in the heart of it, uh, the, the ability to, to meet all of these uh, perception uh, of the L2 plus all the way up to L4. But uh, just looking back, because we lived through multiple revolution uh, throughout our life, uh, so it tells you more or less I've been around for some time. Uh, so we, we, we started, of course, with the, with the compute going from analog to digital, and soon to probably quantum computing. I think there is a, uh, an intermediate step, which is combined analog and digital, especially at this high frequency, like I mentioned. Uh, the wireless going from just fixed to, to mobile, uh, the automotive going from the combustion to hybrid all the way to electric. And then if you combine the 5G, internet of things, smart cities, smart roads, self-driving cars, AI, machine learning, uh, you get into basically the, this next paradigm shift. And the, the one that I showed you the slide at the beginning, uh, which will be an exciting world to, to live in, especially when the area also become part of the ground uh, mobility. Uh, and this is done through sensing. You saw MetaWave is doing the radar. It's, doing, it's done through AI and machine learning. You saw how we made our ra uh, radar uh, smarter. The connectivity solution, and you saw how we, we are working also 
on the 5G side. Um, so hopefully uh, with these uh, software-defined AIP building blocks, you can enable a lot of these capabilities down the road. I want to thank you. This is where we are. So most of the videos that you saw here are either on these roads along the Carlsbad Beach and MetaWave is, you can see here, our logo. This is our building here in Carlsbad, Southern California. Thank you.